Hi, I'm Mike Schiller. I'm the CEO at the Green Building Alliance. If we haven't met, I'd um, enjoy meeting you afterwards. But it, tonight, it is my very distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, which is uh, the mayor of Pittsburgh, Bill Peduto. He has been a, his, a student of the history of Pittsburgh. He's from Pittsburgh. He gets it. He's one of us. And at the same time, he's been around the world. He's not, he has a larger vision for what Pittsburgh can be um, by witness of our travels last week. Even in my, all my time here, Pittsburgh has changed a lot, but um, as mayor, I think Bill Pedoto brings some of the energy, some of the vision, some of the commitment, and actually now some of the team, as he's put a team together to help um, drive a lot of that forward, that makes Pittsburgh a sp specifically exciting place to be right now. I'm looking forward to working with um, the mayor and his administration over the next many years to actually transform Pittsburgh even more than we have so far. Um, with that, I give you Mayor Bill Peduto. You know, it's kind of funny, and I, I got here for the last three presentations, and each presentation, by the way, great job, uh, was kind of inspirational in uh, several ways. Uh, ECS, I had the opportunity of working with Phil Parr, who was my neighbor at the time, uh, to create the school. And uh, got involved very early on in the process and then lobbied the school board, which is kind of a hard thing when you're lobbying for a charter school and uh, trying to explain how it, it will fit a, a role that other schools don't provide. It's not a criticism against the Pittsburgh Public Schools, but in a way sometimes it's taken that way. But it was able to approach it in a different manner and succeed, and then worked with them on their expansion plan and now working with them on further expansion because uh, there's areas of this city that could really use an environmental charter school uh, to help to keep people in certain neighborhoods where our schools, our public schools had to close. Um, Chartier's Valley, my alma mater. Um, Chartier's Valley boy, class of 83. And guess who paid for that sign? My class. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going like, oh, that's amazing. I know exactly what you're talking about and how great it is that it's gonna actually be green. And uh, great job, guys. I mean, as people go down 79, I hope that there's an indication for them that they are literally knowing that the, what's powering it isn't coal, but uh, wind. And uh, it's a great project to take on. And then Langley, the school I get to represent today. Samuel Pierpoint Langley. Uh, I worked on a documentary about the Allegheny Observatory. Got to learn a lot about him and John Bershear. And people may know or may not know that they worked together in creating the first study that came out that talked about the power of the sun in the day that will come that we will have used our natural resources and the ability of the sun that will power more than all the coal mines in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. In the first scientific studies that came out on the ability of solar power came from Pittsburgh, from leaders John Brashear and Samuel Port Point Langley. In fact, a Langley is a unit that measures radiant energy in his name for Pittsburgh's own Samuel Pierpoint Langley. In fact, Langley also created time zones for this country and went on to Langley, Virginia is named after him and the Langley Award for Aviation, USS Langley. We lost that history, but the school is there and is going in his history. And I had to pull up and I had to go to Wikipedia because I couldn't remember exactly um, the work that he had done on something else, which was really interesting. Uh, da, 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 da. There it is. It goes on. He made one of the first attempts to measure the surface temperature of the moon. And realize this is like in 1890s. You know, I, I couldn't measure the temperature in my backyard. I don't even know how this guy's doing. And his measurement of interference of the infrared ra radiation by carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere was used by Savante Arnheis in 1896 to make the first calculation of how climate would change from a future doubling of carbon dioxide levels. Yeah. In the 1890s, Samuel Point Point Langley was the person that started global warming and understanding the effect that carbon dioxide would have in our atmosphere. And you know what? That's every bit as important as Andrew Carnegie and uh, Henry Clay Frick, the fact that we have people like Samuel Pierpoint Langley, that we have people like David Lawrence, who created the first clean 
air laws in the United States 20 years before Congress ever considered it. Mayor Lawrence understood that the future of this city and what he ran on in his campaign was based upon the ability to have clean air and to say the city went in flood and have control over the water. And then about 20 years after that, a young woman from the Allegheny Valley named Rachel Carson marched up the steps of Congress and talked about for the first time the importance of clean water and what we were doing to it. Those are the giants whose shoulders that we stand on in Pittsburgh, the people that brought about the understanding of how environment is directly connected to the prosperity of a region. In forward thinking, it went to the point where it started to be looked at at national level and international level. How great of a history we have in this city. You know, this city started out as a little fortress town where the French came and they said, uh -huh, we are here and this is as far as the new world will go. And along came a guy from the Virginia militia, a major, and he marched across the Laurel Highlands and he came over and he said, you know what? This is where we want it. The British are claiming this to be theirs. And he laid out the, the routes that we now call Penn Avenue. And his name was George Washington. And on his way back through the Laurel Highlands one night, he ran into an encampment of French soldiers. And in the middle of the night, he slit the throat of a young ensign named uh, Jamonville. And from that started the First World War. Because they loved us so much. And Pittsburgh's history has been basically that for about 60, 70 years. We were a fortress town. And we remained a fortress town up until the time that a couple of guys got in a boat that they bought in Pittsburgh and set down the Ohio, and their names were Lewis and Clark. And they set out and they discovered Indiana and other places. And all of a sudden, this new world was a little bit bigger, and there was this manifest destiny that we were going to go from one ocean to another ocean, and their role then became who was going to build it. Who was going to build this brand new world that they found? And then, you know, they look back, Pittsburgh. And it started out with glass, and then iron, and then steel, and then aluminum. And in the process, we became a global leader. We produce 40% of all the steel on earth at our height, just from this little region. And in that same process, we destroyed our air, we destroyed our water, and we created the greatest disparity between the haves and the have-nots in this country's history. And we're Pittsburghers. So we didn't just say, oh, well, tough. <laughs> we rolled up our sleeves. We understood what the problem is, was, and we started to look for ways to solve it. Enter David Lawrence. Enter Rachel Carson. Enter the unions that helped to form the opportunity for people like my grandfather, who had a second grade education, to join the middle class. And the middle class was born in this city and in Detroit and in Cleveland and Chicago. And that's our legacy too. And we went through a renaissance, and a renaissance where we built airports and convention centers and stadiums. And then we tore them down so we could build airports <laughs> and convention centers <laughs> and stadiums. And we looked at neighborhoods and we said, hey, these nice urban areas, how can we make them more suburban? Because people like cars. So we went in and we tore down a lot of houses, tore down public market houses, built big parking lots, built a speedway around East Liberty, built all this different infrastructure that was based around a car, and we called that progress, because that was part of what that Renaissance period was about. And we went through all those different periods. And then, you know, as things still went well because our economy was going well, 1979 came around, sitting there at Chartiers Valley High School in 79, first year as a freshman, and uh, great time because the Pirates won the World Series with Willie Stargell. Steelers won the Super Bowl, Terry Bradshaw, and Pittsburgh died. Pittsburgh died. You know, Chartreuse Valley is a place, or it was a place at least, before Collier Township was stopped being a farm and became a lot of mansions. Chartreuse Valley was a place where your dad worked and your mom worked at home. And by the time that I graduated in 83, a lot of the guys who I were, was friends with had to leave because their, their fathers couldn't find work here anymore. And by 1983, we had unemployment that was higher than Detroit has today. In the 1980s, we lost more people than New Orleans lost after Katrina. And even to this day, our legacy of borrowing to try to fix our solutions leaves us with 
a debt ratio that's higher than New York City's was when it went bankrupt. And yet, there was no federal program for us. There was no bailout or anything else for us to be able to sort of pick ourselves back up. We did what Pittsburghers do. We recognized the problem, we brushed ourselves off, and we reinvented ourselves again. From that little fortress town, to the industrial giant, to the city that went through the Renaissance. And today we're at the next step. And you know the most beautiful part about it? We don't even know what it is, which gives us the opportunity to dream big. We have the opportunity now not to be a model of a city that can be looked at as a model of post-industrial. We have an opportunity to be looked at as a city that is the example of 21st century modern city worldwide. And it's like things out here right behind me where buildings are being built that don't require anything to be plugged in, where the amount of energy that is being produced by the building exceeds the amount of energy that it needs. And to think about the opportunities that are here right now, the opportunity to use our industrial heritage of making things and combining it with the research and development that's going on right over the hill at Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh and bringing them both together to create the products that an entire world will be using for the next 100 years. Products that will be based on sustainable practices, that will be based on the effective and efficient use of materials so that the buildings of tomorrow will never need a grid system or huge power plants that use fossil fuels, but will be powered by the energy they produce themselves in co-generation on a micro level. And you know what? We got places like Hazelwood that are the experimental grounds of making it happen today. The El Mono site. The 28 acres next to Consul Energy Center, how ironic that it will be right there next to that name, uh, in the Hill District. The entire stretch of the Allegheny River, think of it all the way from the Convention Center, don't think of it just as the terminal building. That's just one stop along the way all the way up 3.2 miles to the Highland Park Bridge. As we redevelop our riverfront and redevelop what was used for industrial purposes into an entire new model of sustainable development, we have an opportunity, maybe not an opportunity, maybe we have a responsibility to make sure that we invest and do it right. And we have the partners that are here in this city, the people that put together that building behind me, we didn't have to look across over to Europe. We didn't have to look anywhere around this country. We didn't have to cross any of the bridges that were built with Pittsburgh steel. Well, a couple of them, because a few of the folks lived up on Mount Washington. <laughs> but what we did do is we did it locally. And we have that ability, too. You know, advanced manufacturing is coming back, and it's coming back in a big way in this country. That's why the president is investing so much of his time and energy to making sure that cities that had been industrial in the past have the opportunity to be manufacturing in the future. And places like Pittsburgh don't have to be uh, under the same type of an idea of it has to be big. You know, Carnegie built out these entire systems, railroads and rivers, under an old economy about getting product to market. What we need to look at is we create this new system of economics for this region and this new development and opportunity is making sure that the system itself is sustainable so that we're not building new roads and, and infrastructure in order to do so, but we're using what we have, improving upon it, and understanding that the new economy is about getting people to workplace, which means investing in public transit, which means about giving that same opportunity to the person with the GED that is given to the person with the PhD, which adds the critical element of sustainability into the mix, equity. What's good for one is good for all. What's there for one is there for all. And we have the opportunities to create ladders of opportunity to those that have been left behind in the past 40 years. Now, I have the greatest job on earth because I get to represent a city in transition. It was the city that I was born in, raised in, and will die in. And I love this city. And I can see this immense potential that's there. And what's really striking about it is so can so many other people. And we notice it, and we see it, and we talk about it. And at some points, we forget we're living in it because it's really happening right now. And I can take this cell phone, and I can put it on my chair, and I can go to a beach in Mexico for the next four years, which sounds really good right now. And I could see prosperity happen all around here. 
Oakland will do great. Shadyside's going to do fantastic. Property values in Point Breeze and North Point Breeze and Squirrel Hill, Bloomfield, Lawrenceville, Southside, they're all going to do great. But how do we have that same opportunity there for the folks that are living in Homewood? How do we make sure that it transcends over to Larimer? How are we creating opportunities in Manchester and in Sheridan where Langley School is? That's the challenge of this next part, this next step from that little village that was down at a fortress to the point of an industrial giant to the Renaissance to our time. Our time is about making sure that sustainability goes beyond triple pane glass with argon and it affects the people and it gives them the opportunity like my grandfather had to join the middle class. We hit on all three bottom lines. We make sure that it makes a profit, we make sure that it protects the planet, and we make sure that it helps people. Now think about that and how people will look around the world at Pittsburgh when we use our economic development dollars in a way that helps to prosper all three lines. That's the mission. That's the goal. That's the next great step. And Pittsburgh is poised more than any other city to seize it. Thanks, guys.